I'm Hans Hess. Welcome to the television program today. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Romans Road. It's a really famous um, segment of, and passages in the book of Romans that people put together as a way of describing what it means to be born again, what it means to be a Christian. And many people use it, use it as a witnessing tool. I want to lead you down the Romans Road. Well, that's what I'm going to do today in this sermon. I'm going to lead you down the Romans Road, really looking at just the simple truth of what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be born again? You know, I, I think we need a clear vision of the end and the goal that we're going for so we'll know how to navigate through the trials and circumstances of this world and this life we're in. If you have a clear vision of the end, you know where you're going. And so I'm going to talk about that today. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be born again? What is the Romans road? So listen and open your heart up to what God would speak to you today from his word, and I'll talk to you at the end. I'm going to preach on the Romans road. A young adult asked me about this recently in our church, about the Romans road, and uh, I said, well, it's a good thing to know. So I thought I would just preach it this morning, and uh, some beautiful truths in it, but also there's uh, several things that I think can be accomplished in this, okay? First of all, I think it's a blessing to you if you're not serving the Lord, if you're not a Christian, and uh, you need to become one this morning. I believe with all my heart, time is short, and some of the stuff we're seeing, I just came out of this uh, prophetic... Uh, conference this week in Nashville with our friend Kent Christmas, and uh, it was some of the stuff I heard there was crazy. I mean, I'm talking in private conversation with people who are in higher levels of authority than I am. It was really amazing what possibly is coming on the world. It really is. And um, I don't know. I'm just, can, can, can I just preach what I want to and speak my mind openly? <laughs> You know, you know. We right now, I'm gonna pray that God has grace on our nation because we have right now a hurricane coming, uh, Afghanistan fiasco, a resurgence of COVID, and I heard there are numerous different variants right behind it. So you know, it, it's time that it's time we get on fire and stop playing church and stop messing around. Not, not accusing you, I'm just, I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir this morning, but uh, amen. One man told me the only, I don't know, this is very drastic, okay, so this is very dramatic, but he said the only people who are going to survive are those who know the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we better learn the voice of the Holy Spirit, amen? So I'm going to go back to basics. This is Church 101 this morning. And so, number one, if you're not serving the Lord, this is for you. This is for you to get your heart right this morning. God loves you more than you'll ever know. Yeah. Number two, if you're born again, this is a reminder of how good God is and what that experience means to you and how it's powerful in your life and, and how you can feed on this. There's some stuff I was feasting on in this. Number three, you can take these four points I'm going to give you and you can witness to all of your family and friends and lead them down the Romans road and lead them to Christ. So if you're taking notes, uh, write these four things down, these four scriptures, you can lead anyone to the Lord whose heart is open. Can you say amen? amen. Thank you all for praying for me too. I preached Friday morning and it was like, I had to throttle back because I thought this place was going to explode. That, there was people wall to wall in a hotel in Nashville and it was just like it was... It was on point. Holy smoke. Then, then I turned the mic over to Kent, and Kent just started prophesying, man. It was, be here in October. Kent's coming with his daughter Jasmine, and he's not traveling much anymore. So, but he said, I will come for you, Hans. So it's going to be a blessing to have him. And uh, 
Tony Suarez with us come October. Amen? Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, and let's begin reading with verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips. This is not a seeker-sensitive message. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their ways, or in their ways, and they, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is none righteous, no, not one. You know, ancient accountants used to write in their ledgers at the top of the page, memento mori, which means remember death, so that they could constantly keep before them the idea that they're going to face death and everything we're doing here is temporary. Also, Jerome, the great Latin church father in the fourth century who lived in Bethlehem and translated the Hebrew and Greek scriptures into Latin, and it became the Latinized version of the Bible, the Vulgate, for centuries. Uh, we went there. If some of y'all have been to Israel with me. We went to Bethlehem, and we visited the church of the Nativity, and then outside of the church, there's like this courtyard, and in this courtyard, there's a statue, and it says below Hieronymus, which is Jerome in Latin, and at and, and he's here in this, this big statue, but at his feet sits a human skull. And it was said that Jerome did all of his work with a human skull on his desk all the time to remind him of his own mortality. C.S. Lewis said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next world. There's no way we can properly live life unless we have an understanding of the end. But the end and our understanding of what lies before us calibrates the rest of our life. So we know we're all going to face death one day. Unless Jesus comes while we're standing here living, we will all face death. And death is the great leveler. It levels the playing field. Ecclesiastes talks about it. Rich, poor, brilliant, not. <laughs> Common, blue collar, white. It doesn't matter when you're laying in the casket. It's the great leveler of society and humanity. But we must have an understanding of where we're going when this life is over to properly understand how to live in this present world. There was a lady named Florence Chadwick in 1952. She tried to swim from Catalina Island to the mainland shore of California. She had been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways, the first woman. But the morning she tried to swim off Catalina Island, the weather was foggy, and it was chilly. And so there were boats on either side of her as she was swimming, and in one boat was her mother. And her mother kept telling her, keep on going, you're close, keep on going, but she was tired and she was exhausted and all she could see was the fog, so eventually she quit and had one of the boats pick her up. And at the press conference afterwards, she said this. She said, all I could see was the fog. She was only a half mile from shore. She said, I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. I'm going to paint a picture of how you can get to the shore Amen. this morning, how you can get to the other side. And if you see the end goal, you should be able to make it, and we're all going to help each other cross the finish line one day. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Number one, Romans Road, Romans 3.10, the problem, our problem is sin. Our problem is sin. For all have fallen, 
All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. That means that there's not one person living on planet earth today, nor has ever been since Adam and Eve, with the exception of Jesus because of his miraculous birth, none have been born into this world without sin. The psalmist said, in iniquity I was conceived. We each one were born in with a bent towards sin. G.K. Chesterton, great British author, once wrote the editor of a newspaper who had, uh, they, had published a, they had published an article called What's Wrong with the World? So Chesterton wrote the editor, probably the shortest note he'd ever received in his life. The editor opened the note and it read, I am. What's wrong with the world? I am. What's wrong with the world? You are. We are what's wrong with the world. There's something twisted and bent in the heart of man. Y'all didn't wake up early to hear this this morning, did you? I'm going to get you out of the hole, though. Hold on. There's something twisted and bent in the heart of man. There was an ancient monk named Pelagius and Pelagius believed that when Adam and Eve sinned, it really didn't mean anything to those who would follow. It was just Adam fell and Eve fell, and therefore we're born without sin, and we just look, they're just a bad example for us. Well, the father shot that down. Then there was another morphed form of it later called semi-Pelagianism, which believed that man sinned, and he was affected by sin, but... He's kind of morally sick, but he's not really dead toward God. And the fathers came and kind of shot that down. And they came to the realization that the Bible teaches that we are born into sin, and really man is spiritually dead to God. That there's a death process that has happened. Paul described it in Romans chapter 7. He said, for what I am doing, I don't understand. And for what I will to do, I don't practice that. But you know what? What I hate, that's what I do. He said in verse 18 of chapter 7, For I know that in me that's in my flesh dwells nothing good. For to will is present with me. I want to do good, but how to perform what is good, I don't find that. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. We can disagree over this, and I've had people disagree with me, but I believe Romans 7 is a picture of a Paul who was not born again. A Paul who was struggling with sin as a man trapped in sin, as a man dead to sin. This was our penalty. When we fell, we became, as the fathers called it, incurvitus, bent over, curved over, and bent so deeply, Martin Luther said, we were so deeply curved on ourselves that we even bent the best gifts of God toward ourselves. And it all became, for our sake, bent over by sin. There is a problem in the world, and it's called sin. Hallelujah. You can try to medicate it, you can try to counsel it, you can try to rebuke it, you can do... But it's sin is the, is at the heart of man. Amen? Even in prison. Prison is filled with people who have broken laws, but yet they find that the, the salvation of all that is when they receive Jesus Christ. And some of the most on fire people are in prison just like walking around because they found the answer just like you found the answer. Can somebody shout amen? Sometimes I want to reach through the television and grab the news anchors by the lap of the neck and say the problem is sin. You can blame politicians or you can blame this guy or that guy or this lady or that lady, but the ultimate problem of mankind is sin. Well, number two on the Romans road. Our penalty then is death. What is the penalty of sin? Death. And it's spiritual death. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is 
death. For the wages of sin is death. The first step is Romans 3.10, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, there's, no, there's none righteous before God, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. So, the issue with people today is no one is a sinner. So you can't be saved unless you're a sinner. We don't even like to use the term sinner anymore. The term sinner has been taken out of church circles because it makes people feel bad. I'm going to go preach to this guy. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on. We, the problem is we don't. nobody's lost anymore. And I love what Ray Comfort did years ago. He wrote this book called Hell's Best Kept Secret. And he, and he said he started using the law, the law of God from the Old Testament, to witness to people. How in the world do you do that? He said, I'd walk up to them and I would say, have you ever told a lie? They'd be like, well, yeah, I've told a lie. Okay, then you're a liar. <laughs> Have you ever uh, stolen anything in your life? Well, there was that one time. Then you're a thief. <laughs> and he would walk right down the commandments. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever lusted after what your neighbor has? And his point was calling them out to let them see they are a sinner, like the rest of us. And so there's a problem here. And so if you are a sinner, then there is going to be a penalty attached to the transgression. And it's a penalty that is too high for you to pay. It's a price too great for Hans to pay. And so what is the penalty? According to Scripture, the penalty is death. In Romans chapters 5 through 8, Paul repeatedly speaks of death in relation to spiritual and eternal death, not physical death. Sinful humanity is described as dead, though we're alive biologically. Even Jesus in the Gospels spoke of death in the same way. He described the Pharisees, even though they were alive physically, he said they're dead spiritually. So to be dead in sin means you're spiritually dead. Robert McTeague gives us four different signs of a spiritually dead person. He said, first of all, there's no effort in them to do righteous things. There is an apathetic resignation to the status quo spiritually and no aspiration for a better future for their spiritual life. Second thing is there's no compassion in them to spiritual things. A stone-cold heart in the presence of sin and suffering. That in the presence of sin there's no indignation for the rights and dignity of God. There's no grief over the loss of a human soul. Number three, there's no learning. There's no learning towards spiritual things. There's a refusal to be taught about God's holiness and about our sin. And when we are in love, you know, you want the person you're in love with to talk to you about how they feel about you. Well, it's the same way with the Lord. I think the Lord wants us to talk to Him about how we feel about Him. But the spiritually dead person has no desire, nor even does, does he want to learn about how much God loves him. And then finally, there's no repentance. The spiritually dead person is walking in a state of non-repentance. And McTeague said, a culture that values self-esteem more than it does contrition is most unlikely to produce great saints. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Spiritually dead. It's like zombies. They're alive to some function but the soul is dead. So this should help us somewhat when we operate in the world and if people don't understand where you're coming from, now you can understand why. The God of this, mind, the God of this world, Paul said, has blinded their minds lest they should believe the truth. I was like that. You were like that. I wanted nothing to do with church. I wanted nothing to do with Christian people. I didn't know anything about it, but I didn't want anything to do with it because I wanted to live my life. 
and wanted to pursue my dreams and do my thing. Our problem is sin, and our penalty is death. So what happens to the sinful person who floats off into eternity and never accepts Christ? I don't know anything to give you except the Bible. I can't dress it up. I can't put a cherry on top with whipped cream. I can't make it more palatable except to say they go straight to hell. When they slip out from this world, they open their eyes in eternity, and it's hell. And we've lost an urgency for that. We've lost a real urgency for that. God help Hans Hess. Help me. Years ago, I was in a meeting with John Maxwell. Many of you have heard of the great leadership teacher, John Maxwell. John Maxwell was a Wesleyan pastor. And he said he was pastoring a small church, and all he was concerned about was getting the next bigger church. And he said, I want to impress my superintendent, and I wanted to, to climb the ranks and get a better position after this one. And he said, so there was a man dying in my church, and he said, I went to the hospital to visit him. And we talked about the weather, and we talked about sports, and we talked about family. And I left there. And he said, the guy died. And he said, I was called to the funeral home, so I went to the funeral home, and the family is here, and they opened the casket up, and I see the guy there. And he said, after I saw this guy, I was crushed. I was wrecked. He said, I went home and hit the carpet and cried and wept before God and said, God, make me a soul winner. Make me a soul winner. And he, he so impressed me. I was in person with him in this meeting. And he said, this is what I did. I made a determination that I'd win 140 souls a year to Christ outside the pulpit. And he said, I haven't met that goal, but many years I've come very close. I thought, here's a guy who's famous. He's written books. He was pastoring a mega church in San Diego, California, before he went full-time to his leadership thing, and he's traveling the world. But yet, outside the pulpit, he's still winning upwards of 140 people a year to Christ because he got a vision of what eternity was, and when someone slips out, they're going into eternity. I love being around Doug Eccles. He's my good friend, but he has that passion in him. It eats him alive. That every so many seconds, he had a t-shirt a few years ago, every so many seconds someone is going into eternity. Going into eternity without God, without Christ. What is the end? It is spiritual death. It is spiritual death. I remember a story years ago of a student in an Ivy League school. This is back in the old days. He had a teacher, and, the, and this was a young man of faith, and he was in this class, and this, this professor was just railing, there is no God. The Bible is just fables and fairy tales. And, and it was really hurting this young man because he's trying to hang on to his faith in this public university. And he says, but on the way home for winter break, they, he, he was traveling home, and he stopped at a, like a hostel or a, uh, you know, an, an old place like a bed and breakfast, but in the old days where they would keep you. And he said that night he heard a man next to him screaming and yelling, and he realized it was the professor that he had studied under, but he was dying. And that night he screamed and yelled all night, My feet are on fire! Somebody save me! And he was dying and he was going to hell. All the education and accolades and publications meant nothing. All of the money and all the gold and all the cars. Wow, the Romans road, the road to salvation, starting with all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. They're none righteous before God, all the way to we have peace and no condemnation on our lives because we are in Christ. You know, everyone is trying to fix themselves or trying to fix the world, and we hear everyone talking about it. It reminds me of a story of a bodybuilder who went to apply for a job at a zoo because he saw a sign that said, you know, help wanted. So he showed up and they said, well, actually, we're short on monkeys, so could you dress up in a monkey suit and uh, pretend to be a monkey and, and, and we just need someone like, uh, we're in a pinch. So he's like, well, this is strange. So, so he dresses up in the monkey suit and, you know, and he does the, he does the job. He, he swings from tree to tree, eats some bananas and peanuts, 
And then finally, he gets kind of tired, and as he's swinging on the trees, he slips and he falls down into the lion's den. And he looks around and he sees this lion coming toward him, and he starts screaming and yelling for help. And all of a sudden, the, the, the lion whispers, Hey, shut up, dummy, or we're both going to lose our jobs. So it, it's just a stupid story, but, it, but it's really where we are in life. We're broken. And we're asking others who are broken to fix us. And neither one of us have the solution. The solution is in God. He's the one who came down and stepped onto the bomb site. I use that phrase in the sermon. He steps onto the bomb site and walks through the debris and picks us up and rescues us. The Bible calls Jesus the way maker, the pathfinder, the forerunner. He's the one who came down, made a way, and went back to heaven, showing us the way to God. So right now, if you're searching, I don't know where you are right now. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you're on the job. Maybe you're listening to this in your car, but you're searching for God. Just just pause for a few moments here with me. This could be the greatest few moments of your life. And just ask the Lord, say, help me. Help me right now, Jesus. I need help. I've been asking others for help. I've been reading. I've been listening to different people on TV. And I know you have the answers I need. If you've never accepted the Lord in your life, I want to pray for you right now. Bring you to the end of that Romans road. And as I preached, you must repent. You've got to turn around. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he's raised from the dead. And you'll be saved, the Bible says. So let's do that right now. Pray with me. Father in heaven, I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I accept the Lord Jesus into my heart, and I turn away from my sins and the evil behavior of my past. And I thank you right now that I am saved, and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Come on, can you say amen? Can you say amen? I want to say one more prayer for those of you who are maybe struggling physically in your bodies. God can heal you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you heal the people listening by faith. As they reach out to you, God, I pray you touch them right where they are and minister to them, God, by your power, doing a miracle in their lives. And I give you thanks for it in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. And all of you can say amen. Hey, find a, find, find a church that's full of the Spirit. Get into the Bible. Read it daily. Listen to it daily. Somehow get into the Bible. Find some Christian friends that, you can, help, that can help you grow, and you can walk this road with each other, discipling each other, and you'll be strong in the Lord. Hey, I love you, and I'll see you next week. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun.